Uh, our next speaker is Michelle Bamberger. Dr. Michelle Bamberger, she got her degree in veterinary medicine in Cornell University in 1985. Uh, she got her degree in pharmacology in Hanneman University uh, in um, Philadelphia. She had equine research for two years in the New Bolton Center, University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School. She graduated from uh, Cornell and, and studied at Oxford University and practiced small animal and exotic medicine and surgery in both Massachusetts and New York before opening her own practice in field of behavior medicine. Uh, as a visiting fellow, Dr. Bamberger is the animal behaviorist for Cayuga Dog Rescue. Uh, please welcome Dr. Michelle Bamberger. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, my coworker his, who is here in uh, the audience, um, Professor Robert Oswald. He's been working with me from the start, uh, documenting uh, all the cases uh, that we've been working on. And uh, he is a professor um, at the vet school at Cornell University in the Department of Molecular Medicine. So thank you, Robert, for being here today. We have been studying the effects of gastrulin uh, on animals. And the way uh, uh, that I got into this uh, was uh, through activists uh, in New York uh, they referred me to other activists across the country. Uh, so far, we've documented 17 uh, cases in five states. Uh, again, we're studying the effects of gas drilling on both domestic and companion animals. I came up with a questionnaire uh, with lots of information I get from people, uh, not only on medical issues, but on the background drilling site information. I get as much documentation from them as they have. Um, and I also interview the veterinarians. Uh, lots of different types of exposures uh, we've come uh, across here. Uh, a lot of this sort of thing has been mentioned already. Um, I'm seeing real life cases of, of this stuff. Uh, and again, in the interest of time, what I will do is just run ahead here and uh, jump to my cases. Uh, Uh, the first case, um, it, it was the most dramatic case, uh, was the death of 17 cows um, within one hour from direct exposure to hydraulic fracturing fluid. The cows were in excellent health before this exposure. I was very lucky to uh, talk to the veterinarian involved uh, on this case. Uh, the cows were on a pasture adjacent to the site being fracked. Uh, hundreds of gallons of frac fluid ran onto the cow pasture. You can see in the picture there the, the fluid that collected in the wheel well. Um, the symptoms of the cows, they were actually uh, videotaped. I'm going to be getting that videotape in the mail from an activist in this state uh, where this happened. Um, but there were lots of observers. Again, it was videotaped, but they fell over. They were kicking. Uh, they were reluctant, reluctant to move. Uh, they regurgitated, uh, meaning in, in, uh, for cows, they, they vomited, then they aspirated the vomit. Uh, they foam, were foaming at the mouth, so there was fluid in the lungs, pleural edema. The final necropsy report listed the most likely cause of death as respiratory failure with cardiovascular uh, collapse, circulatory collapse. Although petroleum hydrocarbons were found in the small intestine, lesions in the trachea, lung, liver, and kidneys suggested chemical toxins, exposure to chemical toxins. Quaternary ammonium compounds have been described as producing the same lesions, and that led the toxicologist to start looking at the fracturing fluid list. So you've seen this from other speakers uh, ahead of me. One of the chemicals that was on one of the lists, I, I don't know whether it was Tom's or, or Ron's, uh, but was tetramethyl ammonium chloride. Uh, that is a very highly toxic uh, compound uh, that is reported to produce cardiac arrest, pulmonary edema, as well as paralysis of the respiratory muscles, uh, making that very capable of um, killing these cows, uh, large animals, uh, within one hour. Okay, so the second case um, uh, that I'm going to be talking about today uh, 
uh, was one involving beef cattle. Uh, the beef cattle were exposed to a creek uh, into which wastewater was dumped upstream of the farmer. And this was at a time, this was in Pennsylvania, this was at a time when the DEP was allowing drillers to do this. They are no longer allowed to do that now. Um, and so they dumped upstream of the farmer. The farmer had 60 head uh, on that, exposed to that, uh, in that creek area for their drinking water. The remaining 36 head were, were kept uh, on other pastures without access to that creek. Um, of the 60 head that were exposed to the creek water, 21 died and 16 had subsequent breeding problems. They failed to breed back. No diagnosis was made uh, by the veterinarian. The cows went down and were dead in two to three days. They were treated symptomatically by the veterinarian. There was no response to treatment. Of the 36 that were on the other pastures, there were no unusual health or breeding problems noted with those cows. Okay, so this is another farm. Again, beef cattle. So 140 head of beef cattle were exposed when the liner of a wastewater lagoon was intentionally slit and the fluid leaked into the pond used for drinking water for the cows. Now, I've heard several times from speakers before me that um, uh, at least my understanding was of what they said was that this sort of thing doesn't really happen that often. But when you really get out there and talk to people, talk to, hear what's happening around the country, this does happen. The, uh, oftentimes, the wastewater lagoon is located above where the pasture is or where the pond is or where the drinking water is. And not, this one was slit, but sometimes things spill. They come off the pond and they go uh, come off the, the lagoon and go down the pasture and into the pond uh, and uh, contaminate surface water. In this case, the drinking water for the cows. Of, of those 140 head, approximately 60 died, and the remainder had a high incidence of stillborn calves. The remainder of the herd, which is approximately 60 head, held in another pasture, again showed no unusual health or breeding problems. Um, so uh, again, I went through my uh, initial uh, slides very quickly, but if I had had time to go through it, uh, you would have seen uh, that I would have said that this study that um, uh, uh, Robert and I are involved in is certainly not a perfect study where you've got control and experimental populations where you can change one variable uh, at a time. We really can't do that, but these two cases that I just showed you is very interesting. We didn't expect that we would get cases like this, but they sort of already have their sort of, you know, control and experimental populations and just the way they fell out with where the, where the farmer, uh, farmers kept their, their cows. Um, but this is about as close as we can get to saying that they do strongly implicate, both of these cases, strongly implicate wastewater exposure and the death of cattle and subsequent decreased reproductive success in the survivors. So this case is one involving uh, two homes, uh, A and B. They're encircled by four multi-well pads. And I think one of the speakers before me talked about the, the way those, those uh, pads look. And these, this is what they're doing. Four multi-well pads fairly close to these homes. A wastewater lagoon, a very large wastewater lagoon, is close to both homes at a higher elevation. The owners of the properties have a variety of small and large animals that they keep. Uh, they both noticed water quality issues soon after drilling and fracking began. The owners of home A owned two dogs and a horse. One of the dogs was exposed to wastewater spread by the driller on the road to control dust. Within a day, the dog stopped eating and was lame on the hind end, for which symptomatic treatment was unsuccessful. Observation of the dog suggested poisoning consistent with toxins. The dog was euthanized three days after exposure to the wastewater due to poor prognosis, and the diagnosis listed on the medical records that I got was acute renal failure. Three months later, and soon after testing normal on a physical examination, the horse that they owned, which was a quarter horse, suddenly stopped eating and appeared to be paralyzed in the hind limbs. There was no response to symptomatic treatment, and the horse went on to have convulsions. The horse was euthanized within two weeks after onset, and the diagnosis was acute liver failure. During this time, both homeowners were also caring for animals that had been bred. The owner of home B had a goat that aborted two kids in the first trimester, and the owners of home A had a dog that lost two puppies at term. Uh, I just got an email last night from the owners of uh, home A. Um, there's a woman that breeds puppies, and she's had uh, more loss of puppies uh, the same way, stillborn puppies and puppies just 
a bitch of boarding. So she's still having a lot of problems. Um, soon after drilling and fracking began for the first well, a child living in home B showed signs of fatigue, severe abdominal pain, sore throat, and backache. Six months later, he was hospitalized with confusion and delirium and was given morphine for the abdominal pain. No diagnosis was made. After the sudden death of several animals in the neighborhood, the child's doctor ordered a toxicology screen, which revealed arsenic poisoning as the cause of the boy's sickness. He eventually recovered after, after losing one year of school. So I'll just might add here, um, their water was tested. They found a lot of things in their water. But a couple things that they did find, arsenic, ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol, triethylene glycol. Uh, a couple of those things are highly toxic compounds. They stopped using the water completely. They had to stop using the water even to bathe and for the bathroom for his arsenic levels to go down. Unfortunately, this was not the end of the family's problems. The wastewater lagoon near their home was fitted with aerators to reduce the volume of the wastewater. And the blood tests from the family began testing positive for phenol, a metabolite of benzene. The most recent symptoms from this environmental hazard include headaches and nosebleeds. There was no compensation from the drillers for the health care costs of the child or the loss of the animals. Uh, early on uh, last year, uh, there was a uh, quarantine put in place on a uh, beef farm, beef cattle farm in Tioga County. And um, that struck my interest uh, in a big way because um, I wondered how they came up with the hold times uh, for, those, uh, for those cattle. In other words, hold times are when an animal is treated with antibiotics, they say a certain period of time before the animal can go into slaughter. Um, so I started asking questions uh, to, to find out what was going on there. I think a lot of us have this sort of question, is our food going to be safe if this ever comes here? Or is it even safe now? Um, so this is a quote from a, a Farad official to my question on determination of hold times. Um, Farad stands for Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank. It's an online decision support system that offers information about how to avoid residues of medications and contaminants in food animals. The NIFA stands for National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, so let me just read the quote. We are told by the newly reorganized USDA NIFA that chemical contamination is not, and that's the uh, writer's emphasis, not mine, their priority. Hence, ferret is not a priority, despite pages and volumes of data and arguments to the contrary, including congressional authorizations. So this official went on to explain to me that there was no funding to properly evaluate the chemical contaminants involved in fracking. Our interviews, um, all the people I've interviewed so far and documented cases, um, they document cases where exposed food producing animals have not been tested before slaughter. And where goat and cow dairies in areas testing positive for air and or water contamination are still producing dairy products for human consumption without testing of the animals or the products. We are very concerned that some of these chemicals could appear in milk and meat products made from these animals. Go quickly through here. Um, lots of recommendations. Some of this has already been uh, spoken about, so I'll just uh, move on, except for one thing I'd like to say. Uh, um, the first thing up there, the non-disclosure agreements. Um, uh, a lot of this information that I've gotten on uh, documentation has been very hard won. Uh, we've gathered facts thus far, but uh, it, it's been really hard because of the non-disclosure clauses. Compensation in the form of money and or water supplies in, in exchange for a non-disclosure statement muzzles individuals and prevents information on contamination episodes and health effects from being documented and studied. So a lot of the speakers before me have mentioned all the studies we have to do and information we have to get out there. We're not going to know what's out there, uh, what's happening because of this taking place. And this is my uh, last uh, slide. Um, so in summary, we should pay attention to what is happening to our livestock and our companion animals in states that are being fracked, and we should take a lesson from that. 
We know that because animals are more constantly and intimately exposed to toxins in water, air, and soil than we are, we will see health problems sooner and more intensely. And finally, because of breeding schedules and generation times, we can learn much of congenital defects and malformations, as well as long-term health problems over a short period of time. What is happening to animals and people in states that permit this type of drilling is a health experiment on a grand scale, one without controls, without design, and without knowledge. Thank you. Whose name?